In this session of IntelliQuest, the world's 100 greatest books, we'll read passages from and discuss one of the world's great epic poems, the Aeneid, by the Roman poet Virgil. This poem, which took 11 years to write and is 300 pages long, tells the story of the founding of the Roman Empire through the efforts of the mythical hero Aeneas. This epic is older than the Bible as we know it. For some readers down through the centuries, the Aeneid was a source of magic as well as literature. A popular use of the Aeneid was for fortune-telling, first asking a question, then opening the book at random and looking for meaning in the passage one turned to. Unlike some earlier Greek and Roman epic poems, the Aeneid is not meant to be history, although it brings together dramatic characters and historical events. We'll learn about Roman history and Roman gods from the Aeneid, but first, let's look at the life of the poet Virgil. Virgil was born in 70 B.C. in the northern Italian countryside. His father was a cattle farmer who also had interests in the lumber industry. He sent Virgil to Rome for graduate studies, and this may be the time when Virgil met Octavian, who would become Caesar Augustus, one of Rome's greatest rulers. Virgil may have served briefly in the military around 48 or 47 B.C. Nothing is certain about Virgil's life until 42 B.C., when he lived in Naples and studied philosophy there. Around this time, three things happened. First, Virgil's philosophy teacher died and left his villa in Naples to Virgil. Second, the famous assassination of Julius Caesar was avenged when Julius Caesar's heirs, Antony and Octavian, defeated his killers, Brutus and Cassius, at the Battle of Philippi. Many of the Roman army veterans from this battle were rewarded by Octavian with farms in northern Italy. Virgil's father's farm was among those to be given to the Roman soldiers, and tradition has it that Virgil persuaded Octavian to allow his father to keep the farm. Some historians think his land was taken, however, and Virgil's sadness over this inspired Virgil to write a series of poems about the beauty of rural life. In either case, we can see that the time of Virgil was a time of war. Although Virgil honored some warrior-like Roman values, he was a scholar and a gentle person. He was often ill and preferred life in the country to the bustle of Rome. He traveled in the highest circles of literature, philosophy, and politics, numbering among his friends the Emperor Augustus. Virgil wrote slowly and carefully. He produced two other works before the Aeneid, his rural poems and a philosophical poem on farming. His rural poems are called the Eclogues, and one of the Eclogues has a prophecy about a golden age of peace preceded by the birth of a divine child. Although Virgil was probably referring to the birth of his friend and patron, the Emperor Octavian, Christians believed it to be a prophecy about Christ's birth. Even if the Christian assumption is incorrect, it helped Virgil's work survive, because Christians felt comfortable with studying his poems when they banned or ignored the so-called pagan works of other early Romans or Greeks. Virgil's Aeneid was written between 30 and 19 B.C., as he wrote it, he read drafts of the poem aloud to members of the royal family. Reading poems aloud was the Roman custom, and Virgil enjoyed reading his works to friends and other writers. After eleven years of work on his epic, Virgil became ill traveling in Greece. He was in the final stage of reading and correcting his manuscript. The emperor Octavian Augustus was also in Greece, and with Virgil when the poet grew ill and died. He was fifty years old. Although Virgil had asked that the manuscript be destroyed because he hadn't had a chance to polish it, Augustus intervened. The work was published around 18 B.C. and was considered a masterpiece even then. We'll quote from the Aeneid when possible, so that you can hear how his poetry gives meaning to the story. After we finish the Aeneid, we'll look at its place in literature. There are many, many characters in the book. The principal ones are Aeneas, a mythical hero. Venus, the goddess of love and Aeneas's mother. Jupiter, the king of the gods. Juno, Jupiter's wife and Aeneas's enemy. Dido, the queen of Carthage. Pallas, a young warrior. And Turnus, a Latin warrior who fights Aeneas to the death. The Aeneid starts by telling us that the topic of the poem is the fictional hero Aeneas. The first thing we need to remember is that we are reading a translation from Latin. Every translator will have his own approach to the work, so each translation will be different. For example, 
Here is the first line of the Aeneid according to one translation. I sing of arms and the man who came of old, a fated wanderer. Here is a second translation of the same line. Of arms I sing and the hero, destiny's exile. We can understand from both that the poem is about war, that's implied in the word arms, and about a man, but listen to how differently that man is described. In the first translation, he's called a fated wanderer. In the second, he's called the hero, destiny's exile. In the second translation, the word hero is stronger, and the poetic description, destiny's exile, is more suited to Aeneas than the description of fated wanderer. The translation used in this tape is by Patrick Dickinson. Let's go to the Aeneid, which is divided into twelve sections that are called books. In the first book, we meet Aeneas, destiny's exile, who was driven out of Troy when it fell to the Greeks. Historically, this took place around 1200 B.C. Aeneas is not an historical character. He's both man and god, as his mother is the goddess of love, Venus. His father is a human. Aeneas and the other Trojans were driven out of Troy and are now searching for a new country. But Aeneas is kept from finding a new home by Juno, the queen of the gods. Juno is married to Jupiter, the ruler of the gods. In the poem, Virgil asks the goddess of inspiration, the muse, to tell him why Juno hates Aeneas. Listen to how Virgil's poetry adds depth to the simple action we've described, and how Virgil right away questions the motives of the gods. He says, Muse, remind us what was the root cause of the goddess Juno's wrath. What had Aeneas done that a queen of heaven should break him? Is it a god's nature to nurse an abiding fury? The poem then lists Juno's grievances. First, she wants to stop Aeneas because she's heard a prophecy that her favorite city, Carthage, on the northeast tip of Africa, will one day be destroyed by a race of people who would spring from the blood of a Trojan lord. Juno fears that Aeneas is that Trojan lord. She's determined to keep him and his fellow Trojans from settling so that she can prevent the prophecy from coming true. Juno doesn't like the Trojan people anyway because they're descended from a relationship between her husband, the god Jupiter, and a mortal woman. Also, Juno is still smarting from the humiliation of the Trojan War when the Trojan prince Paris chose Venus instead of Juno as the most beautiful goddess. Paris chose Venus because Venus gave Paris Helen, a Spartan princess who was the most beautiful mortal in the world. Paris's choice of Venus over Juno is called the judgment of Paris, a phrase you may have heard. So Juno is determined to stop Aeneas as he and his fleet of ships sail toward Italy. She goes to the king of the winds and says, A people I abominate are afloat on the Tuscan Sea. Lash the sea to frenzy, shatter their ships, and sink them. The wind god obliges Juno, and Aeneas's ships flounder. Then Neptune, the sea god, becomes angry at the wind god for causing a storm without asking permission. Neptune undoes the harm, and the remains of Aeneas's fleet go to the nearest shore, which, ironically, is near Carthage. Aeneas is afraid that thirteen of his twenty ships are lost, only seven reach shore. His mother, Venus, goes to Jupiter, upset at her son's latest hardship. She says to the king of the gods, You promised the rule of the world to a people sprung from Trojan blood. What has changed your will? O god of gods, when will you grant them an end of their sufferings? Jupiter smiles at Venus and reassures her. Have no fear. The destiny of your people remains unaltered. But since you are so consumed with anxiety for Aeneas... I shall turn forward the hidden pages of fate and speak of the future. Aeneas shall conquer all Italy. A priestess of royal blood will bear twins begotten by Mars, and one of these, Romulus, fostered by a she-wolf, shall found a new city and call his people Romans after his name. And then shall be born Caesar, and his rule shall extend to the ocean itself, his fame to the last star. The bitter centuries of war shall cease then, the world grow mild at last. This is Jupiter's prophecy. Let's look at the place of the gods in this poem. Gods and goddesses take an active part in the Aeneid. They help and hinder Aeneas, depending on their motives. These gods seem more like comic book superheroes than spiritual beings, 
because they use their powers to further their own self-interest. The gods want to be involved in the founding of Rome, and Virgil must think that there is no more important task in the universe. This symbolizes the divine plan behind any historic event, especially behind the birth of the Roman Empire. We need to remember that although we know the Roman Empire is destined to fall, Virgil only knew it was destined to be born and to bring to the world its first taste of lawful government on a grand scale. Another role that the gods play is to show how human attributes, blown up on a grand scale, can change the course of civilization. When a god acts out his anger or love, people are more powerfully affected than when just one or two characters act spiteful or kind. By looking at god-sized emotions, we see how devastating hate can be, or how healing love is. The gods in the Aeneid, then, are more than a plot device or a symbol. They are acting out human feelings on a huge canvas. The gods also represent certain attributes. For example, Venus is the goddess of love, and Jupiter the god of justice. This is another contribution the gods make to the meaning of the Aeneid. To return to our story, Venus is soothed by Jupiter's prophecy. Aeneas and a companion go to Carthage, wrapped in a cloud of invisibility, a gift from Venus. The two make their way into an enormous temple, where, Virgil says, hope shot through Aeneas and a seed of trust in the future rooted in his afflicted heart. The two men see on the temple walls a mural about the destruction of Troy, a sad reminder of why they're on a quest. The queen of Carthage, Dido, enters. She's holding court when a group of men from the ships Aeneas thought were lost comes forward and asks for mercy. One of them says to her, we unhappy Trojans entreat you. Forbid the burning of our ships. We come not to loot. We are not pirates. Our king was named Aeneas, and no man in the world is finer. We ask no more than to sail for Italy. There lies our happiness. Dido says, Who has not heard of Aeneas, of Troy, of its heroes? I give you freedom of this city I am building. Aeneas, happy that his comrades are safe, and touched by Dido's generosity, bursts out of his cloud of invisibility, and Virgil says, He glowed like a god, for Venus had graced him with a head of translucent hair and the warm radiance of youth and eyes shining with delight, like the gloss that artists impart to a fine ivory or silver or marble inlaid with gold. Aeneas thanks Dido and asks that the gods reward her for her goodness. Dido invites them all to a banquet at her palace. But in heaven, Virgil tells us, Venus was reviewing new plans of action. She sends Cupid to Dido, telling Cupid to put the queen in a blaze of passion for Aeneas. Venus wants to make sure that Dido won't turn on Aeneas, even if Juno tries to interfere. Cupid breathes passion into Dido, who is entranced by Aeneas at the banquet that evening. She asks Aeneas to tell the story of how he and his band came to be on their voyage. The next two books of the Aeneid are the story of the fall of Troy and of Aeneas's difficult journeys so far. These adventures include the story of the Trojan horse, the famous wooden horse left outside the gates of Troy by the Greeks. The Trojans have had many other adventures since they were forced from Troy. Aeneas fought huge one-eyed giants, Cyclops, on the island of Sicily where his father died. It was after leaving Sicily that Aeneas was caught in the storm that brought him to Carthage, these adventures are told in flashback, and then we return to the present in Book 4. Queen Dido hangs on Aeneas' every word. Her passion for Aeneas is overwhelming and keeps her from sleep. She goes to her sister Anna for advice and comfort. Dido, a widow, had vowed to remain alone after her husband's death. But Anna encourages her to pursue Aeneas, saying, What a kingdom could swell from such a husband! To what heights of power would Carthage rise with Trojan aid? Juno finds out that Dido is in love with Aeneas. She goes to Venus and sarcastically compliments Venus on her work with Cupid. I congratulate you, you and your boy. It is a wonder when one poor mortal woman is overcome by the conspiring of two gods. Juno proposes that the couple marry, which suits her purpose as well as Venus's. Juno suggests that Dido's court go on a hunting trip, and in the middle of the hunt, Juno will cause a storm that forces Dido and Aeneas into a cave. There she'll join them in marriage. 
The next day, Juno carries out her plan. The couple find themselves alone in a cavern during a powerful storm. They make love in the wild lashings of hail, lightning, and thunder, and in Dido's mind, they're married. But rumor rips through the city about Dido and Aeneas's relationship. Virgil describes rumor as if it were a person, like this. Rumor feeds on speed and bloats in her going. She puts whole cities on the sweat, so from mouth to ear, from mouth to ear, her tattle went with no respect for truth. Virgil adds a mock conversation here, which is still typical of what people say. Pretending to be a gossiper, Virgil says, All the winter letting their kingdoms go to pot, idling, fiddling there in the palace, lapped in luxury, and of course you know what they do. Jupiter, concerned that Aeneas is being sidetracked from his duty, sends Mercury to him with a stern message to leave Carthage. Aeneas tells his men to secretly prepare to go. He'll tell Dido when the time is right. But Dido knows, because, as Virgil puts it, who can trick a lover? She angrily confronts Aeneas, calling him a traitor and reminding him that because of their relationship, she's held in contempt by her people. She says, Is there nothing to keep you? If you go, I cannot but die. Because of you, the Libyan lords detest me. The repute I had is gone. Aeneas can't disobey Jupiter, although he feels compassion for Dido. He says, Oh, cease tormenting both our souls. It is not of my own free will I must seek Italy. Dido explodes with fury against Aeneas and the gods. She says that the gods' pastime is to destroy us. Dido is miserable. Remember, the spell of Cupid is powerful. Dido's enchanted love is stronger than human emotion. A grand and overwhelming passion rules Dido. She asks her sister Anna to help her prepare a pyre, pretending it's to burn all of Aeneas' things and banish his memory. They do this, and Anna leaves. Then Dido sees Aeneas's ships start out of Carthage's port. She curses Aeneas and the Roman nation he's to found, telling her people, the Carthaginians, to forever persecute them. A note here. The Carthaginians and Romans became bitter enemies, as Virgil knew when he wrote this. Dido gets on top of the funeral pyre. She looks at Aeneas's clothes, at their shared bed, and weeps. Sweet relics, sweet while the fates allowed. She plunges Aeneas's sword into her and cries, Let the cruel Trojan in mid-ocean spy these fires and bear my death. But she doesn't die at first. The goddess of death won't come, because Dido's death wasn't according to fate's plan. Her suicide is due to her own passions, so the goddess of death is reluctant to take the strands of Dido's hair that are needed to enter the underworld of death. But Juno takes pity on Dido and sends a messenger to cut off a lock of Dido's hair. This frees Dido from her body. At the beginning of Book 5, Aeneas and the Trojans see Dido's funeral pyre glowing in the sky. It fills them with a sense of doom. Then a storm comes up, throwing them off course. They go to Sicily, where Aeneas' father died. Now Aeneas' father appears to him in a dream and tells Aeneas to visit him in the underworld of the dead. At the beginning of Book 6, Aeneas reaches the southern shore of Italy and goes to a temple to make sacrifice to the gods. Near the temple is the cave of a prophetess, or as she's called, a sibyl. This is a title, not a name. The sibyl predicts to Aeneas that a foreign bride will cause yet more bloodshed for the Trojans, and that Juno will continue to be a problem to him. Aeneas says, O oh, priestess, no new aspect of suffering could take me by surprise. But one thing I pray, passage to within sight of my dear father. The Sibyl agrees to be Aeneas' guide on a trip to the world of the dead so that Aeneas can see his father. They enter a cave and go down dark passages, passing through the gate of the underworld and seeing monstrous ghosts and unhappy beings. They come to a river they need to cross, but the ferryman refuses because mortals have played tricks on him in the past. The Sibyl holds out a golden branch that she brought from the world above, and the ferryman agrees to take them to the other side of the river. There, a monster dog guards a gate. Sybil puts it to sleep with drugged food. Behind the gate are many weeping souls, newborn babies, suicides, and unhappy lovers. Aeneas sees Queen Dido, still angry and miserable. 
He tries to win her forgiveness, and he cries when she walks away from him, unmoved. Soon the path divides. The right fork leads to the Elysian Fields, a heavenly place where Aeneas' father is. The left leads to a dungeon for the damned, where those souls who committed crimes on earth now pay for them. Aeneas and the Sibyl go to the enchanted Elysian Fields, to Aeneas' father. Aeneas finds that he can't embrace his father, who is only spirit now, but they can speak to each other. Aeneas' father explains some of the mysteries of the universe. He says, In the beginning heaven and earth were animated by a spirit within, and a mind interfused with every fiber of the universe. From these fibers there spring the races of men and beasts, the birds that fly, and all the strange shapes of creatures. He talks about where souls go after death, and explains to Aeneas that all souls, even those of good people, must come to the underworld to pay whatever penalties fit their sins. He describes the punishments, saying, Some are hung up helpless to the winds. The stain of sin is cleansed for others of us in a huge whirlpool. Or with fire the sins are burned out of us. Each of us suffers the afterworld we deserve, and are sent here to the Elysian Fields until the end of a thousand years, when God summons all to drink from the river of forgetfulness. Unless God takes the soul's memory away, they won't take a body and return to the trials of earth. He takes Aeneas and the Sibyl to a hill where they look down on a long line of people waiting to go to earth. These are Aeneas's descendants, waiting to make the gods' prophecies of Rome come true. The most famous person toward the front of the line is Romulus, who will found Rome. After Romulus, Aeneas sees the early heroes of Italy, then other heroes down through the centuries. There are men who will make terrible civil wars, and men who will defeat Carthage in battle. At the end of the line is the greatest soul in the group, Octavian Augustus, who will bring a golden age to Italy. This emperor was Virgil's patron, so his prominence here is not surprising. Aeneas' father makes a statement that reflects Virgil's view of Rome and Italy's destiny. He says that Rome will have the gift of government, and he tells Aeneas, That is your bent, to impose upon the nations the code of peace to be clement to the conquered, but utterly to crush the intransigent. This is how Virgil sees Rome, as a world leader and a force for law and order. Now Aeneas knows his country's destiny and his part in it. He and the Sibyl return above ground. The part of the Aeneid we've just reviewed is one of the best examples of how the poem brings together myth, history, philosophy, religion. For example, we see the myths of the underworld, like the monster dog at the gate, we see how fate plays itself out for individuals, such as poor Dido, and for nations, such as the line of Romans waiting to be born. This is both history and philosophy. We hear religion through the story of creation and evolution of the soul. All of these elements blend together to glorify Rome, which is both the purpose of the Aeneid and the essence of Virgil's talent. It's interesting to think about stories of our country's founding, we don't have stories like the Aeneid that blend history and myth, possibly because of America's separation of church and state. Our histories are based on assumed facts, but facts can be misinterpreted or distorted. Virgil's history takes into account the full drama of human existence, even existence beyond this world. We return to Aeneas, who sails north to the part of Italy that's his goal. Finally, he reaches the land he's been traveling to for so many years. Virgil describes Aeneas's first sight of his land. Across the waters, a towering forest through which the Tiber River wound its delightful way. Birds of the bank and stream made all the air mellow with song and fluttered from tree to tree. Joyfully, Aeneas entered the shady river mouth. This land is ruled by the aging King Latinus and his wife Amata. Their only child is a girl, Lavinia, who's been eagerly courted by the neighboring princes. Young King Turnus is considered the best match for Lavinia, because he's king of the neighboring Rutulians, and known for bravery in battle. But King Latinus was told a prophecy that his daughter would marry a foreigner, and their descendants would bring glory to King Latinus's name. This story has spread throughout the land. The day after the Trojans land, Aeneas starts working on building a settlement while a hundred Trojans go to King Latinus's city to ask permission to settle. 
King Latinus is happy to oblige them, and asks that Aeneas come to see him. He hopes that Aeneas is the husband foretold for his daughter Lavinia. The king and the Trojans exchange gifts, and things look promising for Aeneas and his people. But Juno is furious that the Trojans are building their city, especially since she is married to Jupiter, the ruler of the universe, and while the other gods have their way, her desires are thwarted. Juno asks for help from the underworld. She knows she can't stop fate, and that eventually Lavinia and Aeneas will marry, but she can put it off for a while. She asks Alecto, an evil spirit who drips with snakes and hatred, to help. First, Alecto poisons Lavinia's mother with snake venom. Lavinia's mother, who wanted the warrior Turnus for her son-in-law, runs through her city, raving in anger over her frustrated plans. Her poisoning rouses the other mothers to anger, too, and the city is in a rage. Then Alecto goes to Turnus's palace, where the young king of the Rutulians is sleeping. In a dream, she tries to persuade Turnus to war against the Trojans and reclaim Lavinia. At first he refuses. Alecto takes on her form of hissing vipers and terrifies Turnus. Then she fills him with a bloodlust for the Trojans, and he wakes up, calling the Rutulians to arms in defense of Italy. Alecto's third task is with the Trojans, where she gets Aeneas' son to shoot a pet stag from King Latinus's court. This causes a fight between the Latins and the Trojans, which leads to bloodshed. Alecto has achieved Juno's goal so well that Juno is a little frightened of her, and relieved when the snake-ridden spirit goes back to the underworld. War starts between Trojans and Italians, or Latins. Both names apply here. Only King Latinus refuses to take part. Turnus is joined by other warriors and tribes, including a warrior maiden named Camilla. Aeneas is outnumbered and needs allies. He knows that to the north is a city with a long tradition of fighting with the Latins. Aeneas takes two ships and goes there, seeking help. Before he leaves, he sees a good omen and makes a sacrifice to Juno. Throughout the book, characters make sacrifices to thank the gods for their favors or to ward off future problems. This was a basic part of ancient life, that the gods must be remembered. Remembering the gods reminded people of the gods' participation in their lives. When the Trojans reach their destination and get off their ships, a young man named Pallas stops them. Aeneas holds out an olive branch to Pallas, saying the Trojans come in peace and are looking for allies to fight the Latins. Pallas, whose father is the king of the city, happily takes Aeneas to his father. Aeneas and Pallas's father agree to fight the Latins together. He, Aeneas, and his men sleep in the future site of Rome, although Aeneas doesn't know it. Aeneas only feels a sense of awe when he sees the hills that will later be the famous Seven Hills of Rome. Here again, Virgil plants the future in the past for our enjoyment. That night, as Aeneas sleeps, Venus goes to the god of fire and forges, Vulcan, and asks him to make armor for her son. Vulcan promises to do so. The next morning, as Vulcan starts work, Aeneas and the king find other allies. The king's son, Pallas, will lead a small force, and his father is thankful that Pallas will learn the arts of war from Aeneas. As the allies make a treaty, there's a thunderclap in the sky. Aeneas knows that this is a sign from Venus that she's bringing him the armor she promised. Aeneas continues his preparation for war. As Aeneas and his allies enter a wood, Venus appears and gives him stunning armor, a helmet plumed with feathers, a sword, and a shield that has scenes of Rome's future hammered on it, another of Virgil's devices for describing the glories of Rome to come. Now Aeneas is ready to bear the destiny of Rome by bearing his shield with Rome's history on it. Meanwhile, Juno sends a message to Turnus that Aeneas is away from the Trojan fortress, so Turnus attacks. Aeneas's parting words to his soldiers were not to engage in battle, so the Trojans stay inside their settlement. Turnus, eager to fight, rides outside the walls and calls the Trojans cowards, trying to goad them into battle. When that doesn't work, he tries to set their ships on fire. He feels sure that they'll come out to save the ships. Turnus's troops throw flaming torches at the fleet, which catches fire. Jupiter intervenes, turning the ships into sea nymphs. This terrifies the Rutulians, except for their leader, Turnus. 
He thinks it's bad for the Trojans, because now their ships can't be used. The Rutulians go back to their camp as the sun sets. Inside the Trojan settlement, two friends plan a way to get news to Aeneas of the battle. Nisus tells his close friend Euryalus that he, Nisus, has a burning desire to perform an heroic act. He can't stand by. He feels the need to act. Euryalus, who is younger than Nisus, wants to come with his friend and begs for the chance. Nisus finally agrees, and the two go to the warlords with their plan. The warlords are impressed by their bravery, and the two friends leave the settlement to go to Aeneas. Nisus and Euryalus creep through the sleeping enemy, quietly killing them in their sleep. Things go well as they go from body to body, murdering. When dawn is about to break, they start to leave but hear horsemen coming toward them. The younger, Euryalus, has put on a great deal of armor from those he's killed, including a shining helmet. The leader of the horsemen sees it shine and calls for the two men to stop. The friends run in opposite directions, afraid, and Euryalus gets captured. Nisus could have gotten away, but was so concerned for his friend that he comes back to find Euryalus being slain. Nisus kills his friend's slayer and has killed himself. Turnus puts their heads on spikes to parade before the Trojans. The Rutulians attack the Trojan fort again in different parts. The fighting is fierce, and at one point two young Trojans disobey Aeneas's orders. They open the fort gates to attack the Rutulians. The Trojans are quickly outnumbered. Then the Rutulian leader, Turnus, rushes in, invincible, killing Trojan soldiers left and right. But in his lust to kill, Turnus misses his chance to get into the main fortress. The Trojans finally regain their courage and push Turnus out. At the beginning of the next section, Book Ten, Jupiter is upset with his fighting. He wanted the Trojans and Rutulians to be friends. He calls the gods together to talk about it. Venus blames the war on Turnus, suggesting that Jupiter's wife Juno played a part in Turnus's warfaring. Juno says that it isn't her fault that Aeneas wants to marry Lavinia, Turnus's promised bride. Juno says that the earlier war between Greece and Troy wasn't her fault either. All the gods take sides, and Jupiter, disgusted with them, refuses to take either side. He leaves it to fate. Aeneas finally returns to the exhausted Trojan forces. Turnus decides to fight on the beach to prevent Aeneas and reinforcements from getting to the fort. But he's too late for some of Aeneas's men, who, headed by Aeneas, launch a successful attack. Pallas, Aeneas's ally from the north, is in the battle. Turnus attacks Pallas, who is no match for the angry warrior giant. Turnus kills him, but in deference to Pallas's courage, does not mangle Pallas's corpse, taking only a belt from Pallas's body for an ornament. Aeneas looks for Turnus to engage him in combat, but Juno has conjured up a ghost that looks like Aeneas, and the ghost entices Turnus to a waiting ship. Juno cuts the ship's mooring, and Turnus goes out to sea, angry at the trick that keeps him from battle and honor. The battle continues without Turnus, and Aeneas is forced into many difficult fights, as are the other Trojans. Finally, both sides want to stop. A truce is called as smoke from the soldiers' funeral pyres rises over the fields. The Latin leaders meet. King Latinus believes his kingdom is large enough for Trojans and Latins alike. But Turnus is furious at the idea of peace. He prefers death in battle. At that moment, a messenger comes in, saying that the Trojans and their allies are heading for the city. Turnus jumps up and asks if they're all going to sit there while their city is destroyed. The others join him to protect the city. Turnus's ally, the warrior maiden Camilla, suggests that he guard the city while she and her troops engage the Trojan cavalry in the field. Turnus admires Camilla, who, like Latin soldiers, was raised in physical hardship that prepared her for war. The two armies charge each other on the battlefield, and the air is filled with arrows and spears. The Trojans gain the advantage, and the Latins retreat to their city. Camilla fights more fiercely than the rest, wielding an axe and shooting arrows. But when she's killed, so are the Latins' chances for success. Nightfall ends the day's fighting. Now we come to the last book in the epic poem, when Aeneas fights his final battle. Turnus, Aeneas's enemy, believes that he, Turnus, is the only thing that can keep the nations of Italy as they were before Aeneas's arrival. 
Ternus is mad with revenge and the desire to kill, especially to kill Aeneas. The war will be settled in single combat, Ternus against Aeneas. Juno still wants to save Ternus. She asks a water nymph to assume a disguise and get the Rutulians to attack the Trojans by telling them it's ignoble to let Ternus do their fighting for them. As the nymph agitates the Rutulians, a flock of swans flying overhead attacks an eagle. The Rutulians see this as an omen they should attack the Trojans, and battle starts again. Aeneas tries to stop it, shouting that they must honor the treaty. Suddenly an arrow hits him in the knee, and he limps away, bleeding profusely. Turnus's enthusiasm for battle is renewed, and he carelessly rides his chariot across the battlefield, trampling the wounded and letting the blades of his chariot wheels cut men down. Aeneas's men try to stop the blood from Aeneas's wound with no success. It takes Venus, his mother, to remove the arrowhead and stop the bleeding. Aeneas is so impatient to get back to the battle that he hardly notices. He's furious that the treaty was broken and plunges into the fighting with great spirit. He looks for Turnus, but again the nymph protects Turnus by guiding Turnus's horses away every time they come close to Aeneas. The two men fight very differently. Aeneas kills only when he has to, while Turnus kills as much as he can and puts the heads of those he's slain on his chariot. Finally, Aeneas stops looking for Turnus on the field and goes with his men to attack the city walls. Fires break out in a hundred places as the Trojans take the town. Turnus hears sounds of anguish from the city and returns there. Aeneas sees him coming and comes out to meet him. Turnus raises his sword and strikes Aeneas's shield, which breaks Turnus's sword in two. Then Turnus realizes that he used not his own, but his charioteer's sword. He calls to his men for another sword as Aeneas chases him around a circle made by soldiers from both sides. Aeneas hurls a spear at Turnus, but it misses. Aeneas closes in on Turnus, saying, Turnus, this is no foot race, is it? This is a hand-to-hand -hand fight, a fight to the death. Turnus answers, I am not afraid of your violent words. It is the gods I fear, and my enemy, Jupiter. Turnus picks up a rock so large it would take a dozen men to lift it, and throws it at Aeneas. He misses. Virgil tells us how Turnus feels as he faces death. Virgil says, Just as it is in dreams, we want to exert our utmost efforts but cannot move a muscle. We cannot utter a word or a sound. Just so it was with Turnus. Aeneas stood poised to strike with the fatal spear. Turnus asks for mercy. As Aeneas wounds him, and just as Aeneas is about to grant Turnus his life, he sees on Turnus's shoulder the belt of his ally Pallas. Aeneas plunges his sword into Turnus, saying, It is Pallas who with this blow makes you his sacrifice. And Turnus dies, his soul resentfully flying to the underworld. Here the Aeneid ends. The Aeneid can hardly be called a celebration of war, because it's too filled with the pain of combat. Also, it glorifies the peacemaker and the time of peace prophesied to come. And the poem is not very suspenseful. We are told what the gods plan to do and why. The work's meaning is as art, as creative literature. It has a psychological and emotional perspective that the reader can identify with and learn from. The mortals and the gods, their conversations, their meddling, their plans and dreams, their desires, are the themes of any modern novel. This is a poem that tells the story of Rome, but it also tells the story of people caught in a nation's fate and in each other's destinies. That's the basic story of most literature, an individual's struggle to find meaning in conflict. If one philosophy or viewpoint is particularly important in the Aeneid, it's the ancient practice of Stoicism. Stoicism emphasizes courage and duty. It honors divinity and the connection between God or gods and everyday life. We see this in Aeneas, who's willing to sacrifice himself for his country. This was the noblest Roman characteristic, and the one that Virgil wants us to remember. Throughout the Aeneid, we're impressed with Roman bravery and determination, and that courage in the face of adversity is compelling enough to merit the attention of any god. It seems natural that, if the gods existed, they would want to be part of this legend. 
On his deathbed, Virgil wrote his epitaph. He said, I sang of pastures, farms, and rulers. Yes, Virgil sang of Italy's most important attributes, the beauty of Italy's countryside, the Italian reverence for bringing a living out of the land, and Rome's leaders, who brought an era of inspired law to a world just approaching modern civilization. This is the end of the session.